Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Mr. Lashley, I think you have the honors. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you bow your heads and pray with me, please. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful day that you have created. And dear Lord, give us the strength and wisdom and the guidance to do the business for the citizens of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible through you. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is approval of the agenda, and I think we have a motion. Um, the motion's changed a little bit from what I originally planned it, so I'm going to have to look at my notes. Uh, I'm making a motion that we move item 6C. 6A, the sheriff has a call to make an event this morning at 11 o'clock and we need to maybe get out of here for so that would put them on the first one item on the agenda. And then there's a question about a lightning on 5F in the consent agenda and I'm recommending we move that to 6C. Uh, to allow for, for uh, getting that language corrected. I'll suck at that. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Motion to approve the amended agenda. I'll second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, next is public comments. George Hunt. Thank you. I explained to Mr. Hunt early on that uh, we don't allow former DAs to, <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess i got a clock going here, yes. Well, uh, Commissioner Turner is one of the reasons I'm here today, not mainly because I got on him about some things that I'm going to speak about today, and he said, why don't you come over and talk to the commissioners about it and let them hear it as well. But let me first... Microphone, please. There. Everybody hear me now? Let me first just start with a little story. There was a high school class that was a honors uh, students, maybe 20 of them in the classroom. And the teacher was really laid back. Everybody got along really well until this one particular Monday. He comes into the class. He has a, the seats, the desk, and a circle. In the center of the circle, there's a little plant stand with a fish bowl with a little goldfish in it. He comes in like a drill sergeant. Never before had that happened. Sit down, shut up, don't say anything. If you move or you say anything, you fail for the year. He went over and took the goldfish, there was one goldfish in the bowl, took it out, laid it down, and left. These kids are sitting there, not saying anything, watching the fish, 30 seconds goes by, a minute goes by, and then the one student, this young lady, gets up and puts the goldfish back in the bowl. The teacher comes in and rails at the others. And the reason he did that, see what the world has done to you? See what the world has done. You need to always do the right thing. Just because I told you to do that, you can't do that. Now, Alamance County and the citizens are the goldfish. And we need y'all to put them back in the bowl. 
I'm specifically here, not at the sheriff's beckoning, but I'm here because there's a dangerous situation at that jail over there. Understaffed, about 44 detention officers down. Uh, numbers of injuries of detention officers last year. However, the defendants who get arrested also have fear. Now, there's a good bond policy. Most people can get out, but a lot of people can't. There are with 300 people there. That needs to be looked at. These officers are underpaid. We lose officers to Gilbert County all the time and to other counties, so we need to raise the money. But we're at a tipping point where somebody is going to get uh, killed or seriously injured in that jail, and Alamance County is going to be on the hook for a whole lot of money. I've got 14 seconds to go. Teachers are not paid. So one of the things we'll have to do that's nothing we want to do is we've got to raise taxes. You know, and we all get our tax bill. We don't like that for property taxes, but we put them down and pay it. And we need... Yeah, Mr. Hunt, you have 30 more seconds because your mic was off initially. I appreciate that. But we need to raise taxes or whatever to pay these officers because they're putting their, their life on the line every time they go out. And while everybody else is getting paid, we ain't putting our life on the line. There's a migrant center getting ready to be open in Greensboro. The borders are open. The election is in November. We can't load up the team after the fact. We need to get them to full strength and pay them well. I appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Lee Johnson. You need to hand those help first. Good morning, board. My name's Lee Johnson. I'm a graduate of Cummins High School, 1982. These pictures that I'm putting in front of you, the first one is Williams High School football field. Football field looks really nice. Been taken care of. Well, if you flip over the pages, I'm going to show you the pictures at my school. Cummins football field looks like crap. The sprinkler system has not worked in over 10 years because the repair is not being done. Also, <coughs> I've been to a couple school board meetings and I've talked to Mr. Hook, and Mr. Hook has been to my school. He has brought some people out there to look at the bleachers. And in your pictures, there are some pictures of some bleachers. The bleachers do not meet code. Them bleachers were installed in 1982 when I graduated from school there. Long time. Them bleachers was gay from Duke University 15 years prior to that these bleachers are about to cave in they're rusted now last year I went to a football game and fell through the steps and I want to tell you something if I fall again or if anybody else gets hurt on them bleachers you're going to have some lawsuits and it's going to cost you more than $300,000 Mr. Hook has got a price to replace them things them bleachers for $300,000 that's what it's going to take. The bleachers need to be taken out and replaced. You'll see on one of the pictures, they're all rusted. Are we going to allow the fans to not be able to show up this year because the bleachers are not going to pass code? These, these people want to go and watch football games at high school at Cummins. They want to be enjoy themselves. I want to go and be able to enjoy myself. But when I go look at all these other schools around here and they look a whole lot nicer than coming, something's wrong. And I know what part of the problem is, is part of a couple of employees in the school because they don't care. But I care. I want my school fixed. Look at the baseball field. 
Two years ago, they had 40 kids come out for a baseball team. This past year, they had six because they ain't got no baseball field fixed over. It's maintenance. Maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Talked to Mr. Hook about this two or three times. You'll see the building in the back of the lime and everything back here. Give me 30 seconds more, please. I know the school board's attempting to give y'all $250,000 back from the school board that y'all loaned them or gave them a year ago. I'm asking y'all to give them the $250,000 back to fix my school. And that's what I'm asking. Thank you, sir. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let me remind everybody, we commissioners can a lot and do not respond at all at this point. But we have county commissioner comments at the end of the meeting, and we often do address public speakers at that point. But we're not able to do so at this point. Uh, Stuart Smith. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Stuart Smith. I'm a resident of 811 South 3rd Street in Mebbin. In an election year after a property tax revaluation, the popular campaign slogan for some is cutting the property tax rate. As you enter the process of setting the budget for the next fiscal year, I hope you consider our most valuable asset, our county employees. In the past, because of circumstances, our commissioners had to make difficult decisions. Unfortunately, our county employees were perhaps affected more than some of us in an attempt to keep the property tax low as possible. After the financial crisis of 2008, our nation and our county were reeling. Companies were laying off employees, businesses were closing, and people were working reduced hours. In 2009, our county employees got no salary increase. In 2010, employees got no raises and took five furlough days. In 2011, employees got no salary increases and took two furlough days. In 2012, employees got no salary increases. In 2013, employees received a salary increase but reduction in longevity pay. In 2014, longevity pay was eliminated. From 2010 to 2015, Alamance County lost 51 experienced deputies and 82 detention officers. It was estimated at that time the expense to train a law enforcement officer was $31,000. As we moved on from the financial crisis and made some progress on employee raises, we were hit with COVID and another setback for our county. As we move forward, I commend you for building the reserve fund. It is there for a reason. Circumstances beyond our control can happen at any moment. I would like to remind everyone of the opportunity of the quarter cent sales and use tax. It does not apply to unprepared groceries and auto fuel. The one quarter cent sales and use tax is equivalent to approximately a nickel on the property tax rate. The current sales tax we pay in Alamance County is six and three quarter cent, 4.75 the state, 2% county. In some cases, we are paying the quarter cent sales tax anyway. If we buy a dollar newspaper, the merchant rounds the purchase price up to a dollar and seven cent. A call to the North Carolina Department of Revenue was revealing to me. The quarter cent we pay does not go to the merchant or the county, but it goes to the state. I hope at some point we can redirect that quarter cent to Alamance County where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jeff Wood. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Jeff Wood. My wife Carol and I live at 2827 Clifford Ray Road, Haw River, North Carolina. We've lived at this house since 2020. I spoke with Chairman uh, John Paisley a couple of weeks ago about my concerns, and I have not only in my neighborhood, but throughout Alamance County. He stated I should present these concerns to the commissioners. My concerns are the rundown, uninhabitable properties within Alamance County. These properties are not only devalue the surrounding properties, they also pose a health and safety risk. Health including, factors include wild animals taking up shelter and raising their youngs. I mean, we got wild cats running around taking up shelter in these places. Security is, is uh, safety is, is uh, kids. If the kids uh, go in these houses, there's potential collapse uh, or falling through the floor. Um, I have photos of four properties on my road within sight of my house. And I have a packet for each of you to look at, and I uh, want you to do that after I get my three minutes because I was warned. <laughs> I am asking you as county commissioners to, to work with the planning department or any other departments that may need to be involved to create an ordinance that will require owners of these properties to make them respectable and livable. Not that they have to be inhabited, uh, must be, uh, that they don't have to be occupied, but must be able to be. If not possible, then they should be torn down and landscaped properly. Plus there's all kinds of trash in my neighborhood from years ago that's never been cleaned up. And I know my realtor got fined for my house when I bought it. The ordinance should allow proper time to rehabilitate or remove the structures before the county takes corrective action. And when I say timely, I'm not talking two or three years, I'm talking six to nine months. Last, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak with you and we'll be willing to answer any questions, but you guys said you aren't allowed to talk, so got in under my three minutes. And we thank you. We're allowed to talk, but not until the end of the meeting. So, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. We now have the consent agenda, and we've already passed a motion to amend taking uh, 5F off the consent. Do we have a motion as to the amended agenda? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Lashley second, did the second, Madam Clerk. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, we're now into the uh, business into the meeting beyond the uh, consent agenda item uh, 6C public safety compensation Miss York good morning commissioners uh, I'm going to introduce this item but we have a team of folks here who can help answer questions should you have any at your last meeting on the 19th the sheriff made a presentation um, <coughs> for assistance with turnover and difficulties recruiting and retaining staff. Staff has since then met uh, and put together a plan of compensation enhancements for the board's consideration. We'd like to start by asking the board to consider paying out balances of holiday leave that has been earned by employees beginning in April. And we would ask that uh, the funding source for this come from lap salary. So we would like for this to apply to the Sheriff's Office, Detention, uh, EMS, and CECOM, all of our public safety entities which are working more than the standard eight to five workday and are required to work holidays. And we financially have that covered. Yes, we have verified that all of those departments have enough lap salary to pay out uh, in the April paycheck 
out of lap salary, a balance down to a bank of 40 hours. So we're not completely taking all of the holiday hours. We would leave them some in case they'd like to use those to supplement vacation leave um, or other, other uses. But this would give them um, a, a nice paycheck uh, to thank them for their service. We would then like to begin working on a policy that would come back to the board for consideration, which would... And let me interrupt there, if, I, if you don't mind. Um, they already, already get paid for holidays with their deferred currently. Is that correct? Right. They're earning pay like any other day, and then they're not able to necessarily take the time. So we're seeing very large balances of holiday leave accruing for employees without the ability to really use a lot of that leave. So this just advances the pay. Right. So you are paying out holiday leave when somebody decides to terminate employment with us or retire. This is just advancing that um, payment to them because they're not able to, t a lot of them are not able to take the time off. So instead of us having a large debt sitting out there, we're paying it as we go. Right, which is putting some money in our employees' pockets to help compensate for these difficult schedules. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Chairman, may I jump in here? <clears throat> Absolutely. I just want to make sure I understand what holiday leave is. Yes. So you, acc you accrue leave during holidays when you, when you don't work or when you, or if, you, if, do you do, if you do work? If you do work. Okay, so if you work on a holiday, right. you... <laughs> Am I wrong? I, I just want to make sure I understand yeah, what we're talking about. public safety positions, because their schedules are rotating, they all get their holidays banked. So they all get 12 hours of holiday banked. Mm -hmm. It banks automatically, regardless if they're scheduled that day or not. Thank you. supplement their schedule that week. Right. So it's a little different for our public safety employees than the rest of the organization. And then they can take when they want, or if they don't take, then... It continues to accrue, accrue right now. Okay. okay. I think it's hard to take it. Yes. And you don't want anybody to fill in because Correct. of shortages. Okay. Correct. Sounds, wow, look at all I got in my pocket, but I'll right. never get to use it because right. I got to go right back in. And so for this is for any individual who has a balance over 40 hours? Correct. Why would you bank any of it? I mean, why bank 40 hours? We received that request from some of our employees in EMS that they would like to maintain a balance of holiday leave. So that they can take it later if so they, they choose to okay. If they don't have a lot of vacation time accrued, they might be able to supplement this for that. Okay. Do we know what the total is? The total cost or the pay, total hours? The total, well, both. Both. Um, I don't have the total hours in front of me, but I do have the cost of the, this is the estimated holiday pay to pay out at the April paycheck. Um, we are looking at a total cost of $444,806.39. I'm happy to break that down by department if that's helpful to you. And that does leave a remaining balance of lap salary. I don't want to convey that we're taking all of that money. There is still plenty of money left in lap salary for all of these departments. And that wouldn't have, this uh, that wouldn't have a, a cost for next it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It would not bake in a cost for a next budget cycle because it's. This action it's would not, not. It's kind of a one-time okay. payout of that balance. Okay. Thank but you. But we would like to bring back a policy for the board to consider, where we would regularly pay out, maybe twice a year, a December and a June payment, those balances which exceed 40 hours per week, so that we're not uh, having these large liabilities for pay. Uh, plus, it's allowing employees to receive that payment. Okay. So that will be forthcoming um, as one of our strategies going forward. I just want to think, is the yeah. highest amount you would suspect would be detention? I think the largest balance when I glanced, yeah. and I did not do a thorough analysis, Cheryl might want to jump in, um, <coughs> was an EMS, actually. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So let me highlight some of the other strategies that we're going to be bringing back to the board here as we move forward. I mentioned the policy to regularly pay out the holiday leave. We'd also like to incentivize our employees to work the holidays by suggesting that they would earn time and a half for holiday pay. So right now, there's not a lot of incentive to give up your time with your family to work on those holidays. This would allow us to consider paying them above what 
the regular earnings rate is with the time and a half. Well, most of them have to work them anyway. So. Right. But this right helps now. kind of incentivize or make it less painful when you're <laughs> sacrificing that time um, to be able to, to come to work for us. Might actually incent an employee without a family situation sure. to volunteer for somebody sure. who had a family and wanted to use the holiday yes. off. So this would be another piece that would be in that policy that we'd like to bring back to the board for future consideration. Also mentioned that we would need to have some budgeted costs for this moving forward. So we can't start this right now because it's hard for us to gauge exactly how much in a short period of time this will cost us. And we want to plan for that in the upcoming budget. Question, does, does a hospital do something like this because they're never closed either? You know what I mean? I have Monday heard that, Sunday, but I've not verified it's just, that. It's crazy hours to start with, but it's never closed. Our jail doesn't close. Correct. You know, we'll see you in two days. We don't do that. Right. So, okay, just trying to figure out how we can make this the best for our employees. Yeah. You are also aware that we are continuing to work with Baker Tilly, the consultant who did the um, phase one market study for us, and we are asking them to look at a separate pay plan for our public safety employees. It's very difficult to fit in all of our positions. Right. And these public safety jobs are quite different in terms of hours worked, uh, risks taken on the job, those sort of um, challenges that our employees are facing. So wanted to make you aware that we're looking at that and would bring that back to the board uh, for discussion this spring as well. Um, we're also asking Baker Tilly to help us um, reclass some of our jobs. Uh, you know, we ran into a problem with a lot of employees being paid over the max of their job, and it may just be an opportunity to reclass some positions to bring them into align, alignment with the actual duties required. So we're looking at that as well. And then finally, um, the sheriff's office is looking to provide a pay differential for those employees who are working in the investigations unit. Right now, they are uh, being paid at the same level as some of our deputies, and so wanting to separate those out and provide an incentive uh, for a higher pay for those positions as well. So that would be um, proposed in next year's budget, and the board would have the opportunity at that time to consider that request. So do we need a motion on item one? I think what we're asking for today is the ability to go ahead and pay out these balances up, uh, down to 40 hours, and that would go in our uh, public safety employees' April paycheck and, and paid out of lap salary. So I will move that we adopt item 6-1. Actually, I guess it would be now 6-A-1. 6-A-1. Uh, as to the uh, holiday pay, and we instruct staff to look at items two through six for the new budget. Second. I just have a clarification. I just yes. want to clarify what you just said. Yes. Uh, it won't take but a second, I promise, guys. Um, I, the total cost for EMS, detention, and the deputies are 404000 404, no, let me clarify that. So we also have CECOM in there, your okay. 911 employees. Uh, the total estimated holiday pay um, would be 444,000, 806 and 39 cents. 444. Okay. Correct. Um, that's total, right? That's a total. That's everything. That's for all of those departments. Yes. Hmm. I'm a little perplexed here. The numbers I was looking at last night were much larger, uh, but then again, I was looking at the whole entire ball of wax. But I had everybody in there, EMS, detention, and the deputies. The only thing I didn't have was CECOM. <laughs> and my it's, numbers were a little bit larger. It's uh, also based on the balances of each of these um, departments for each employee's balance, individual balance. So that would be kind of hard to project without going into okay. our MENA system and seeing what those balances are. Yeah, I might have been a bit early to the party. Um, <laughs> and we're not recommending paying this. Nobody else is earning a holiday okay, like I guess, they are. I guess the focus question I want to put on is uh, <laughs> at, at some point it, it would be nice to get the hours, the total hours that I you're looking at. I do have that. Oh, you do? just passed to me. Excellent. Yes. Our excellent staff calculated 13,402 <laughs> hours 
to be paid out. Wow. Okay, that that brings me to my question. Thirteen thousand four zero two. No, those are hours. Hours. Okay. Um, you know, looking at this over the weekend, I sort of got an idea that this could be a huge number, if not taken care of. I guess what I'm saying is, do we have a policy that restricts the hours that the person can bank? Like you can you can only have so many hours, and once you get that limit, you're going to have to do something else. My understanding is that we don't have that uh, limitation on holiday. We do have that on sick leave. And vacation. I'm sorry, on vacation. And comp time. And comp time. So that's well, because detention so and the sheriff's department, particularly even um, ambulance, all kinds of things need to be servicing holidays. I'm not sure this is a good idea to not allow the banking and or payout. That is this motion as it stands. I'm just thinking here. <laughs> I just what I'm, what I'm trying to trying to do is I don't want the county to have an issue in which you allow these hours to keep increasing and increasing, and we don't have a corresponding liability in our budget to suggest financially. Okay, this is where we're we're. I know we. I told you I have an like example. I told you I have 10 million bucks in my account, but it's actually less 444,000. I guess what I'm trying to to keep from doing is having an issue in which the county has a big liability that's not budgeted. You know what I'm saying? It's not budgeted. I know you look at your your fund balance is <coughs> seventy million dollars, so you don't really have to worry about four forty, but I'm just thinking in the scheme of things, could you get yourself in a situation in which you have a million or two million dollar hole that you didn't budget for or didn't have any recourse for that's that's where I'm coming from I think what you what you're doing in the spring I think it's a great idea um, I'm just thinking out loud here. Sure. just because the numbers that I had were Are you talking like use or lose no okay. no I just was thinking like if the county allows the employees to build up their uh, balance in such a way that it creates uh, a liability for the county going forward like, for example, we didn't budget to have a $2 million liability for salaries, but yet we do. And yet we don't have a way to pay for it. I didn't want to have to go dive into my, my, my savings account to take care of that. I just want to make sure that it's, it's being managed as we go down the road so it doesn't get too large. Yeah. And that's part of the reason for the policy that we need to have in place yeah, this so that we can begin I think you're right. getting some control of those expenditures and projecting those. But right now, we don't know when people would leave. We don't know when that cost hits. And fortunately or unfortunately, we have large lap salary balances that are able to take care of that as <coughs> needed. But this would put a policy in place to manage uh, that. Ms. Evans, is there any anything else besides these two hours and um, the, the total cost? Is there anything else in that equation that we would need to look at? Not at this time. Okay. Thank uh, you. Not vacation and not sick leave or sick time accumulation? Mm -hmm. That creates a liability as well, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It does create a liability, um, but we manage that in such a way that when employees reach that maximum limit of vacation time, those days convert to sick. And so those are, are applicable for retirement. So they don't lose those days. They're just in a different category. But are, do we have a corresponding balance sheet <coughs> record of what those accumulated totals are, right? We, we do. have that. Okay. So we don't book the actual liability to our books because that's a fluid number. It can change at any point in time. It is presented in the audit, right. but it's not an actual liability that I'm recording. I'm glad you said that because that's where I was looking at. I was looking at the audit, and I was like, why is the discrepancy here? Uh -huh. That explains it. Thank you so very much. As I understand it, we already owe the money. This allows employees to take the cash... Yes. or to bank it, whichever, um, and it helps us with the budgeting and your audit in that we pay it out now instead of when they retire or when they move or something else. And I really do like the idea of two times a year having let employees decide if they yeah. want to dip in there. Because, you know, people, family have issues, emergencies that come up, and 
it's good to have them have the opportunity. It's also interesting you said it was 13,402 hours. Yes. That kind of pales to 101,922 calls. So somehow, whatever. <laughs> We have a motion. We have the motion and the second, Just, Mr. Turner. Just a couple more questions, Mr. Sure. Chairman, and this relates to items three and four. So that's not about the vote, but it's it's about the, the plan that we might bring back. Yes. Um, item three: compensate all individuals working holidays at time and a half. What does all individuals mean? Is that just these three it departments? Is, it, okay. yeah, right. It would still be these. There's four if you count detention separately from sheriff's office. Okay. CECOM and 911. So, yes, that would apply to just those employees. Okay. And for a public safety pay, working towards a public safety pay scale yes. that's different, does that sort of address Mr. Lashley's comment at the last meeting about this idea of hazard pay? Is that, is that what we're talking here? Um, not, it's not really the same thing. I okay. think we're looking at separating out these employees in their own pay plan so that they are not being classified the same as non-public safety positions. We know right. that those positions are challenged differently in terms of recruitment and retention. Okay. And so letting us have some flexibility in how those positions are paid versus the rest of the organization. And then I had a question about timing. When, when the market study folks were here, they were talking about a, a second phase, maybe this time next year, would this move, would this plan move that market study up? What we're talking about here, I think we've kind of called informally phase 1B. Okay. <laughs> so we're continuing to look at the same departments that we have. That's our EMS, uh, EMS detention. Or just detention, detention and, and then DSS. DSS. Okay. Yes. So bringing back some recommendations and asking the question, do we want to do more than meet the market, was what we, was the direction I was given, and what might that look like? So those departments, some of them have worked on some proposals. I attended the DSS board meeting and heard their proposal. The sheriff has worked on some uh, proposals as well. So trying to put all of these together to bring back a kind of a phase 1B study sometime this spring okay. to use some of the remaining uh, market study funds that were not required in, in phase 1 How would we pay for the study itself? Uh, we're already under contract with Baker Tilly. Um, so this is just continued work. It's not a new expenditure on that piece. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Sheriff, you're you were very welcome to leave, you. and unfortunately for Bonnie <laughs> Holland's funeral. Yes, sir. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank sir. We'd like to say Bonnie Holland, um, wonderful officer, yes. good friend to most of us in this room, uh, and we regret that he passed away. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Yeah, he's a good, he's a good, he's a good one. Well, I'd also mention that Monty Holland was on my balloon crew for a number of years. <laughs> okay, we're going to 6B, uh, the event center feasibility. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Grace Vandevisser um, with the Alamance County Visitors Bureau. And uh, last year we completed the event feasibility study um, that has been for a while um, a lot of interest in the community. Uh, we did hire Hunden Partners to come in and um, met with many of you, if not all of you, um, and many partners in the community and um, planners regionally as well. Um, online we have um, our representative for Hunden, uh, Lexi Cuff, who will be highlighting um, what that study looked like in regards to an event center. Yep. 
Hi everyone, Lexi Cuff with Hunnam Partners, uh, project manager here. We're based out of Chicago, but like Grace mentioned, obviously was in the market for a site visit and have completed this study uh, there forward. So for today, just going to go through our executive summary, just intro, why we were engaged um, to perform a market analysis and financial feasibility study relating to the development of a new event or convention center, whatever capacity that really looks like in terms of the demand within Alamance County. Um, so starting off here with our situational overview, obviously understanding the region and the and the boundary lines and outline for Alamance County. Um, our study really did provide those market-driven analytics to determine the overall demand and opportunity, which I'll get into in a few slides here for event-related development in the area, as well as the adjacent amenities really needed to attract some larger events and meeting planners' interests. So. There's currently a minimal supply of indoor function space, which many of you are aware of, uh, for meetings and events within the local area with those larger conventions and trade shows and consumer shows taking place in the regional facilities. So ultimately, our key questions that our study addressed here is what is the market demand for a new event or convention center in Alamance County? What does that supply currently look like? What's the optimal size and configuration, programming, and demand projections of a new event or convention center? What are the existing market conditions locally, regionally that may affect those various types of events? How is the hotel market performing with Alamance County? Is there an adequate supply of lodging facilities in order to support a new event or convention center that would ultimately be driving hotel room nights? And then finally, what are the overall opportunities for Alamance County given its geographic location and market attributes? So overall, our study, our kind of methodology here, our project objectives, is we took a look at where you are now as a county, looking at the current assets for event facilities, including the visitation induced, their attributes and quality and overall performance, how that stacks up to surrounding communities, not only within the regional market, but also looking at some case studies of similar market sizes and what those event facilities really look like. And that really took us to what are the opportunities. So based on that assessment, we identified strong areas of opportunity that would ultimately elevate Alamance County and the visitation that it currently draws. And then finally, how we get there. So what are the next steps in the study? How do you execute, execute and really implement these opportunities here? Uh, one of those things being a presentation like the one we're doing today. But ultimately, our SWOT overview, this details our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats as it relates to the project. So strengths being accessibility, that strong connection with I-485, and then that growing population um, in multiple pockets of the county, but really having that continued interest for development from the county perspective. And then that strong hotel performance with the, the existing supply, very strong occupancy and room rates, um, especially following the pandemic where hotels were hurting across the country. Overall weaknesses, uh, there is a limited local demand generators compared to surrounding destination markets such as Durham, Raleigh, um, the existing strong venue supply in those adjacent counties to the east and to the west, and then the lodging supply mainly consisting of those limited service properties um, accommodating the transient visitor, not as much of a group or corporate business presence. And then opportunities, there is the opportunity to position the county as a suburban meetings market looking at a long-term goal, so around 20 years down the line, as Durham and Raleigh continue to grow and develop and become a higher tier convention and meetings facility market. Uh, but right now, there, there are some more limited opportunities in terms of leveraging existing assets within the county. And then sports tourism and tournaments was identified as a potential opportunity, but not necessarily covered within uh, the scope of our project. And then finally, our threats there. Uh, local community asset versus a tourism inducer. Would this be a project or a building that would mainly just serve the local community versus really driving those hotel room nights? Um, rising construction costs, unfortunately, is just a, a threat in any development in any city around the country right now. And then land availability, ultimately understanding where this would be situated to be the best uh, asset for the county. So overall headlines, I kind of addressed those, those questions I just went through there. Uh, local supply, again, it does have a handful of 
smaller indoor event venues, but there really are only two dedicated meeting facilities within the within the county that can accommodate upwards of 250 people. Uh, and that being the Alliance Convention Center and then the Inn at Elon are the only facilities that accommodate larger groups. However, availability is extremely limited. Those larger events that seek space in the market must go to those regional facilities where pricing and availability is more competitive than a typical suburban market. Um, hotel performance, so this is a positive that the lodging market within Alamance County um, does perform very well, even though it is consisting only of select service branded hotel properties along that highway with limited room counts. But again, it does show strong rates and occupancies on the weekends and for new hotel developments in the pipeline of our study, which does suggest a healthy lodging market with robust interest. A new event center would ultimately induce consistent visitation year round, which would put some pressure on the existing hotels during those busy seasons or weekends. Um, a future full service hotel development near the project would be a potential need and would help to attract larger events beyond the regional market. And then kind of moving into our regional market here, obviously it is very competitive between major markets such as Durham, Raleigh, Greensboro, in addition to those university towns that have their own respective um, event and meeting facilities like Chapel Hill and Wake Forest. Uh, so there is demand for small to medium size events that's not currently being met by the supply in the regional market um, because those are really focusing on catering to those larger conventions, trade shows, and events that do drive in those uh, significant hotel room nights or room blocks, so to speak. Uh, so this is le leaving lower rated business with minimal <coughs> options. So ultimately our market opportunity here in Alamance County, it does show strong opportunities for a multi-purpose, flexible uh, venue around 10,000 plus or minus square foot ballroom and event center that could host that wide range of events and provide attendees with ease of access in a unique setting. Uh, currently, the demand exists for a large flexible space that could host more than 500 people for an event. This space would allow Alamance County to capture local demand that's currently left unaccommodated, as well as attracting regional events that are too small for the convention centers within that regional market. So they do, Alamance County, you do have the potential to expand on this facility in the future if the site's, site constraints allow for it um, to offer that greater footprint in the meetings and event space with other functions such as indoor sports. Again, as this region really does grow to be a more meetings and convention market hub. Um, so ultimately, our study covered all these things, what influences the viability and recommendations here, looked at, again, the existing supply, the local market, site location, the industry realities and trends, uh, comparable and peers performance, what are those key successes and failures, um, and then that existing demand. So we took a look at that, and we ultimately came up with these recommendations here. So as it currently sits, the opportunity for a convention or large conference facility is minimal, and that's just due to the strong regional supply that is heavily saturated. Um, it would be entering into a very competitive regional market with not enough demand to really understand um, what that long-term or the longevity of success or uh, self-sustaining performance would be. But if there were to be a convention or conference facility, and we did model this out to give an understanding, the minimum would be about 30,000 square feet. Um, and again, that potential long-term opportunity 10 to 15 years down the road, but right now demand is not currently strong enough to support a conference or convention center or conference hotel. But there is a good opportunity with meetings and social events. So the regional supply is a bit more moderate in this category here. Um, it's limited and unique flexible event spaces that accommodate social corporate events. This would be a minimum of about 10,000 square feet. And again, it's because the regional market does offer those larger convention spaces that does lead to smaller social events with limited date availability. And given its location and unique downtowns, Alamance County can compete for these events with a compelling space with a competitive pricing structure. And then finally, indoor sports. This was something that was brought up as a strong opportunity, but again, it wasn't really necessarily covered in our scope for this study. But understanding that the regional supply is moderate and that there could be a potential for indoor sports with a, a deeper dive feasibility study to really understand and determine the d demand and sizing adequate for the region. So ultimately our recommendations being that very flexible multi-purpose 10,000 give or take square foot event space with the ability to expand upon within the future 
um, this would be a uh, key would be flexibility in order to really meet the needs of various small to medium sized social corporate and community related events. Um, and then again, that opportunity to further expand on this facility. So kind of giving an idea, we worked with an architect, uh, Convergence Design based out of Kansas City, who came up with just some concept ideas or potential layouts to give an idea of how an event center would really look within that future expansion, um, kind of acting as parking in a, in a phase one scenario. Um, but we did model out or do financial demand and financial models for two scenarios, that being the, the smaller event center at about 10,000 square feet of function space would be about 24,000 gross area. Um, and then that larger, more convention conference style um, event center being about 30,000 square feet of indoor function space with a gross area of about 66,000. Um, and you can see the, the construction cost noted here again by Convergence Designs estimates. And these are based on similar, um, similar size facilities, but also the market realities of those rising constru construction costs that I mentioned earlier on. So obviously a big price tag difference there with the smaller one being about 17.5 million and then the larger event center being about 43.3 million. Um, but then after our kind of demand and financial projections, understanding what would that economic impact be, not only directly from the facility, but also the indirect induced spending of increased visitation to Alamance County. So this is for the small program here. We have about 81 million in net new spending, uh, 35 million in net new earnings, and that would be supporting about 19 uh, net new full-time or equivalent jobs from direct, indirect, and induced, and then about 1.1 million in county taxes and 2.4 million in local property tax with a capsule tax of about 3.5 million, and this is over a 30-year time frame. So looking at those construction impacts, obviously seeing that 17.6 million price tag, there would be sales tax, sales tax generated of about 49,000 um, just from construction and then supporting construction jobs of about 179. And then comparing that with the larger program, definitely a higher economic impact, but that's also due to, you know, obviously having a, a higher price tag there with that 43.3 million uh, construction cost, but that's supporting about 440 construction jobs and 121,000 in sales tax generated. And then looking at our 30 year impacts from the larger uh, event center being about 243 million in net new spending, 104 million in net new earnings, supporting 57 plus net new or full time or equivalent jobs, and then 3.5 million in county taxes, 5.8 million in local property tax, um, for about 9.3 million in our capital taxes. Again, over that 30 year time frame. So, um, kind of summing up what we went through here. Obviously, wanting to give you give you guys the opportunity to really understand um, the differences between a smaller event, more flexible event center versus this larger, more convention style building. Um, and obviously giving uh, the opportunity for whether or not this would be a poly policy decision of what route the county would want to go down. But I can answer any questions right now if there are any that brings us to uh, the end of our presentation here. Okay, board questions, comments. I'll have one question for Mr. Baker. Uh, does the current revenue generated from the county's occupancy tax cover the debt for a seventeen million dollar facility? Not within the, not the amount of money that we would be allowed to spend on the capital. Oh, thank you, Mr. Connor. Well, I think. Um, in the abbreviated preliminary release, the conclusion appeared to be that this was probably not something that we really wanted to look at right now. <coughs> if I can uh, chime in here as well with Lexi, this is a, a this was a, is a great tool for us to have because we have had um, over many years um, an interest in finding out what would what this would look like, um, and our office does get calls on occasion do we have this type of study? So this is a great resource, whether it's something that um, moves forward through the public sector um, or not. Um, if we have um, a, 
you know, someone private or a partner who wants to have this information and say this might be a good fit for them in the future, it's here and available for them to utilize. Um, as Lexi mentioned, great opportunity for really a convention or an event center that has um, a hotel attached to it. Um, that would certainly elevate that and um, the cost burden is a little bit different there. Might we, are, are we sharing this with the uh, ec our economic development we will arm the, with the uh, chamber, chamber. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and they were involved in it um, right. Reagan was there um, so she has a copy um, but they do have the most current and they need more we'll, we'll I mean, they gather might more. want to share that then with anybody that be interested in doing a private mm -hmm. investment of this nature mm -hmm. but and I don't know possibly a public private partnership mm -hmm. but I can't see us putting that kind of money into something like that right mm -hmm. now We've got too many real hard needs here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ms. Thompson. No. Mr. Lashley. No, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, I do have a comment. Um, I agree with Mr. Carter, we don't have the funding at this point, but I've also talked to some of the uh, movers and shakers in the county financially. Um, Alan Gant, for example, with uh, Lynn Raven. Mm -hmm. um, and he and I discussed not a countywide situation or a tax obligated uh, situation, but bringing in, instead of playing small ball, play large ball. Mm -hmm. And those of us that play, played any sports understand the difference between small ball and, and Talking about Big softball ball. Or, or baseball. Oh, well, whatever. Large <laughs> ball versus small uh, ball. For example, Kingsport, Tennessee. They brought in Kodak, uh, mm -hmm. and they brought in the Marriott, and they didn't play small ball. They play, played large ball. They have a massive golf course. They have uh, all kinds of facilities. They have annually there the Miss Universe contest, uh, and many, many... Um, activities like that. Kingsport, Tennessee is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, definitely. But it brings in a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's that convention center that does it. Mm -hmm. But the Marriott, uh, Kodak join together with some help, not financially, but with the community college there, with the county and the municipal governments uh, having a very small part of the financial obligation but uh, those big entities carrying the wall financially. Um, we're going to have the Southern Loop in the hopefully not too far off future. Um, and they're talking about moving the Southern Loop not to around the airport area, but south of the community of Alamance, uh, which brings it you know, even out further. And there are our tracts of land that are large enough to play the, what I call again, large ball, mm -hmm. um, instead of a facility that would not be competing with Greensboro or Durham <coughs> or Chapel, well, there's not much in Chapel Hill, um, and, um, you know, Wake County, but could be a, an entity of itself. And so I would encourage us to at least look at that opportunity. Uh, and Mr. Carter's handing me uh, a proposal for the uh, Southern Loop. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that's a possibility that we need to at least encourage and bring in the lab cores or the Hondas or the uh, Glen Ravens and so forth to participate in it and help fund it. And you had mentioned that before. That, that's public-private <laughs> partnership. <laughs> Mr. Carter is saying that's what he said. <laughs> right. And right. I agree. Right. All those things would definitely have to be um, looked at and assessed through that, um, from both of those partnerships. Um, and, and, you know, some of the slides that are not here are the, um, the projections for, you know, the expenses to maintain those buildings. Um, and that's certainly something I know that, I would assume that the county would not want to uh, have that, therefore you have that private uh, sector coming in. Um, and I believe you all have um, the full 
presentation. Um, so again, this being part of the whole package to be able to present to somebody so that they make a, a well-informed decision um, among all the partners together on what that would look like in the future. Might add uh, that LabCorp is building a tremendous hangar complex mm -hmm. at the Burlington Airport as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, was out there by there over the weekend. Uh, it's massive. Their entire Air Force for LabCorp is now moving and will be totally in Alamance County very, very soon. They have planes currently that are too large to house in Alamance County. So that's why the new facility uh, increases our tax base for uh, the taxpayers, which is a very positive thing. So I think all of those, including Alan Gant, who uh, you know, encouraged that to happen, are a real possibility. So, uh, and we need to encourage the chamber to be part of that. Thank you. No, thank you. Now that airport facility for LabCorp is going to run, including the airplanes, at around 100 million. Yeah. Big increase in our tax base here. And then we have uh, Bucky's and several others. Mm -hmm. Things are looking better tax-wise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Okay, we're now going to <laughs> uh, what I assume is the Alamance County Community Services Agency update. Um, and Ms. Fields, is, I think you're handling that. Thank you. I think you're right. This needs to go below Alamance, but right now this comes up above that. I think you're down. Mr. Carter's pointing out uh, currently the Southern Loop. Uh, is right around Alamance, and it probably needs to be projected slightly so further southern. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning. My name is Danielle Fields, and I'm the executive director <clears throat> at Alamance County Community Services Agency. I'm here today um, with support from our board chairman, Mr. Charles Rogers, and a board member, uh, CeeLo Fawcett, as well as our finance officer. So I'm here today to provide you an update on the agency. Um, some of you may know the agency is ALCAP, Alamance Community Action Program, but we have been uh, Alamance County Community Services Agency for quite some time. It was originally organized in 1965 by um, the Board of Commissioners and jointly funded by the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh, Alamance County Community Services is a community action agency, and community action agencies are the only nonprofits that are mandated by federal legislation to serve low income communities, disadvantaged, and marginalized individuals. On December 18th, 2023, Governor Coopiner designated Alamance County Community Services Agency. Um, as the Community Action Agency to provide community service block grant funded services in Rockingham, Caswell, and Person Counties, expanding our service area to the four county region. Um, I have provided you with the designation from the governor as well. Community action agencies are held annually to a set of 59 organizational standards, which are federally mandated. I have provided the most recent North Carolina DHHS risk assessment for Alamance County Community Services Agency. As you will see, the areas of assessment include audit reporting, performance, programmatic performance, key staff experience, and agency compliance history. Uh, the agency received a low risk assessment as it has for the past several years. I have provided you with copy of that as well. Um, I've also provided you with copy of the Community Service Block Grant Self-Sufficiency Program outcomes from the Emergency Food Assistant Program as well for fiscal year 23-24. Keeping in mind our food pantry is not funded through donations underneath the Community Service Block Grant. That is solely donations and outside um, grants that we write. We do receive the majority of our referrals from Department of Social Services for our food pantry. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you're aware of that as well. I've also uh, provided to you the Community Service Block Grant Self-Sufficiency Program um, 
for the four county region, the targets that we will be working on once that begins July 1st. The agency has recently also embarked upon a collaboration with North Carolina Community Action Association. We will be advocating for um, community resilience and adverse childhood experiences. Out of the original study that came out of Kaiser Permanente, the CDC has, in September of 2023, recently become more involved with that program. And we will be holding two community forums for our community members to learn about resiliency, learn about adverse childhood experiences, and have the ability to know about um, people in the community that provide those services. So I thank you for your time. And before you leave, Mr. Turner, any comments? Thank you very Question. much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Horner. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Mm -hmm. Thompson, I think you're the one that really encouraged this presentation. Do you I'm, have comments? I'm just glad to see you guys pulling in with ACEs. That determines everything that walks in the school. It's so important what children go through with trauma. Yes. We don't have a clue. And that there is an effect of that kid. So thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Lashley. Oh, I have no questions, but thank you for your presentation. I think it's extremely important, and it's it's uh, something that information that Alamance County citizens need to need to hear. And I totally agree. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, we're now moving to item new item six D, which is the. Uh, regarding the residency requirement for board members. And Mr. Turner, I'm gonna let you take the lead on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have any problem with the intent behind the resolution. I did have a question about the language in paragraph two. Um, my concern is that some boards have requirements that folks uh, be part of a particular industry, the TDA comes to mind. It's often really hard to fill those uh, and so I wondered if the if the carve out for the employment um, exemption was too narrow. Uh, now that, Mr. Stevens, do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, so I understand your concern and appreciate that. Um, I think the reason this came to light and the reason we're having this conversation is largely because of the residency of a person who is on such a board. And, and the desire was to make sure that person's interests were more closely aligned with the community based on residency in Alamance County. I understand your concern. I, my, my concern is that if we were to create a larger possibility for folks like that to be involved, if we open the net too wide, then we're basically swallowing the entire rule. So I'm just trying to figure out how to craft that. Um, what, I, what I would suggest and, and what I have drafted as a suggestion is to allow for folks, let me just read it, that members of appointed boards who serve only as required by their employment or as an industry representative are exempt from this requirement so long as they are residents of North Carolina. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. I mean, I think that that creates a situation where folks are they're working in Alamance County. They've got a direct employment relationship with uh, either an employer or an industry that we we have, and, and they're residents of the state such that they're basically just commuting from somewhere else to be here as their primary employment. Yeah, I think that works. Okay. Yeah. Are you making a motion? Well, I move that we adopt the resolution uh, with the changes that Mr. Stevens articulated. I'll second that. Any other comments? You don't see like other counties. Are we, is that in compliance with like other counties? So there's a state law. The norm? I'm sorry. No, is that kind of like the norm that you just kind of work around stuff like this? Yeah, I think it's the norm. I mean, there's a state law that says that we can require residency of folks that we appoint for these boards. So we're certainly within our right to do it. Um, and I think other counties struggle with this too. And I think, again, what we've talked about and what the desire is, is to have folks whose interests are aligned directly with the community who are helping you guys make these decisions. So we wanted to make sure that they are, in fact, either residents or either closely aligned with employment um, with Alamance County. Any other comments? I have a motion, second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. And thank Mr. You. Turner, thank you. Mr. Stevens, thank you. Thank you. I'll make that change before you sign. All right. 
item what used to be 6D Board of <coughs> Health appointment. You want me to take this? You can. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I sit on the Board of Health Committee, and uh, last week at our meeting, we sat down and interviewed two individuals for our professional engineering position. And uh, after my committee sat down and interviewed the two folks and then sat down and we decided that uh, we would like to um, nominate Dan Paste for the professional engineering position for the, to fill the uh, position on the Board of Health. Let me interject here. We have multiple candidates is why it is not on the uh, consent agenda. Uh, so we as a board must make the decision as to between the two individuals, one single individual. There's only, only one opening. So I would make a motion to um, put Dan Paste as the, the nominated per, uh, individual I'll for this. That. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? I have one single comment. I was really impressed with the credentials of both these gentlemen. Very, very good. Um, both well qualified. And uh, so the individual that is not chosen, I would encourage to stay engaged. And uh, if there's another opening, certainly follow an application. Okay, we have a motion, second. All in favor of the motion, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Next item is uh, County Attorney's Report. Thank you, Chair. Just briefly, I wanted to let the board know that we have spoken with Mr. Wood. He was one of the folks who came today to speak with you about his concerns about neighborhood blight uh, and brought some photos for you to review. Uh, my staff has been in touch with him and actually um, the health department has been as well. So we've gone out, I believe we're going out today to do some investigation as to his claims and we should have more to report back at some point in the future. That's all for me today. And we thank you. Thank Mr. You. Stevens, don't, don't we presently have an ordinance on abandoned properties? We have some ordinances that might apply to dilapidated buildings and as to uh, what was allegedly trash strewn about properties. Um, so we have some enforcement mechanisms there. Um, we just want to look at the properties first, kind of see what we're dealing with, and we'll go from there. Are there tax issues with these properties where they haven't been paying property taxes? I'm honestly not sure. I'm sorry. That might be something to look at. I mean, I know we have some issues where we have um, abandoned properties where there are some um, environmental issues that we don't right. want where the county would want to take possession. But, you know, if you have a tax issue here with an abandoned property, maybe we could take possession of it and re remove it. You're right. I would say there's probably a higher than normal chance that people who leave properties abandoned are probably not paying their property taxes, right. but I'm just not sure yet. We can look into that as well. And there can be a foreclosure for failure to pay. That's correct. And then um, either a public auction or the county take it over or whatever, depending on the circumstances. Right. That's correct. And we do those quarterly, so we could easily add that to our list. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. All right. Um, county manager. I do not have any report, but I did want to call your attention to within your board packet is your December 23rd, 2023, sorry, investment report from our finance director. I'm happy to answer questions about that, but nothing further. Thank you. Any questions? Got a comment. <laughs> yes. Um, I hope the commissioners took a look at uh, the information that Ms. Evans sent us from our December sales tax. I would yes. suggest that the commissioners take a really hard look at that with the upcoming budget. You're going to see some numbers that are coming into line like we told you they were. They were going to come into line. As a matter of fact, our sales taxes aren't as high as we thought they were going yeah. to be. The reason why it's really important is December is the strongest month of the 12th. That's right. And December came in at pretty much what we were expecting, but under what we had projected for the month of December. My, my projection, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to let the commissioners know that uh, the consumer is starting to weaken. You can see it. 
uh, you got six months of data that shows that the consumer is weakening. And if you want to go back and look at the Federal Reserve announced last week that the um, inflation rate is starting to level out again and is starting to come up. Now, inflation is going to rear its ugly head when your energy prices come back and summer's coming and energy prices are too. So I just wanted to let the commissioners know that you need to take a look at that. Uh, it's very, very important for this upcoming budget. Uh, makes me very nervous. I know our projections next year are going to have to be dead on. That's it. And Mr. Lashley is nervous often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, what that's what happens when you deal with financial markets. They have a tendency to, to get you. <laughs> okay, County Commissioner's comments. Uh, Ms. Thompson? I just want to thank Mr. Johnson for coming here to talk about his alumni school Cummins. I went to Southern, and um, you just always want to see your schools continue to thrive. And um, it starts at the home, starts with the family, what walks in the schools. But, you know, I was at the school board meeting the other week, and you got issues with playgrounds, too. It's just kind of all hitting the fan after years of the whatever. But um, Cummins has always been a strong part of the community, and we can't let them down. Those boys and girls deserve a ball field. I was over there and saw their field. I've talked about it. Um, when you see different schools, you can tell different PTOs. You, it just all adds up together. But um, we cannot let our schools fail. They, there's a lot going on with our schools, and that's our issue. And we got to make sure we make sure our kids have a good place and a good safe place to go, and our teachers have a good safe place to teach. And um, it's so important. And talking about this gentleman's house is, sir, I'm kind of like the trash czar. I appreciate what you've got here. And all the ones I've reported to the health department are just, it just takes so long when you especially get into court. Many times you end up getting adult protective services in. You don't know there's an adult living there sometimes or children living in a camper or different things like that. And it's so important that um, we can have ordinances all day long, but we have to really enforce these things to make sure because if you live beside something like this, it, it's a kind of like one particular place when you have to trap 100 feral cats. That says a lot, and it's a real letdown in the neighborhood, and it's unsafe. So children need to be able to play out in the yard and be safe, not depending on what's living beside them. So we just have to make really good decisions and just be real good citizens. That's what it comes down to. And if you need help with something like that, you know, get people involved, because when it gets to a hoarding position, it's out of control, and you just can't do it. You have to have outside help to help you with it. It's kind of like an addiction of anything else. So. Mr. Lashley. Uh, not for me, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Nothing for me. Thank you. Mr. Palmer. Well, going to the issue of Cummings uh, ball fields, um, we've had so many issues come up recently where we have funded items with ABSS and they haven't spent the funds. Is there a way for us to check and see if there's any money? left over that was in ABSS funding. I'll address that to Ms. Evans. Find out if we if, if, the, if there's some way we've got money over there that can be spent to get this fixed. I can take a look. And that's that's terrible. Okay, um, oh, I'm uh, sorry we, we don't allow further speaking. I apologize, Mr. Johnson. Talking about inflation, I have to admit I don't do a whole lot of shopping, so I have to rely on my wife to bring this to my attention. But she's been talking about the increases in the prices at the grocery store. And uh, I was shocked when I looked at it, actually took the time to look at it, how much grocery prices alone have gone up. And uh, that's impacting all of our citizens. I mean, um, when you take that into account, with everything else, and it's probably not going to come back down. I mean, it would take a serious recession for those prices to start to actually turn into deflation versus inflation, and I don't know that we're going to see that. So we're probably stuck where we are, and that's a function of what's happening to our sales tax because people can't afford to go out and buy <coughs> replacement clothes, replacement furniture maybe replace vehicles, things of that nature, because they're paying so much more for just sustaining their lifestyle. 
Okay, as to both the public speakers uh, that are still here, thank goodness, we appreciate that. Uh, I spoke to both of them on the telephone uh, prior to this meeting, uh, and I it sincerely understand the problems and appreciate not only you're bringing that to the attention of everyone, but me specifically. Thank you. Uh, as to the rundown housing is in the um, situation, first off, um, there are criminal laws that, and you can bring, um, as I understand, there's a homeowners association in close proximity, uh, say, and you may even have a um, class action as homeowners in that development. Uh, you may have a lawsuit, and I understand you're seeking legal assistance from an attorney. I think that's very, very positive, at least to know what your options are. Um, and then Mr. Stevens, he's going to, our county attorney is going to research this issue and see how much further we can, as a county board, uh, take, take that into consideration. Now, you understand we don't handle anything inside a city, municipality. Um, yeah, that's handled by the city itself, not by the county. Uh, but properties that are not in a municipality, in a city, uh, we do have input, um, and we do have roughly, what, 62 ordinances um, and other things that govern part of that. And Mr. Stevens will research that. And we appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Uh, as to Mr. Johnson, and Cummings High School. Uh, my wife taught for 42 years, and all but about 10 of those were at Broadview Middle School, right next door. Uh, and I know the funding uh, has not been always even as to different schools or different whatever, but we as the county commissioners, we are required to provide for the capital funding, uh, and we do that. And over the last decade, we have given the school system everything basically that they've requested. Uh, if you go back and look at some of the, we had on the county site um, an indicator as to roofing only. And um, as to all the pictures that we were seeing on local TV, Channel 2, Channel 8, Channel 11, Channel 12, we had over $5 million or $5 million allotted to Graham High School that had not been touched. And we had uh, had $5 million for Southern High School with, that had not been touched. And it had been sitting there for years without taking responsibility. But that's, we can fund it, but we can't make it happen. That's the school board. And so I would encourage you to look at the school board heavily and encourage them to do their job if the money's sitting there has already been provided for by the county, we can't make them do it, but we sure are encouraging. Uh, and by the way, there is a state audit that is now currently ongoing, uh, and that's part of the audit. Uh, there are changing th changes that are taking place. Have you seen in the newspapers and, and various news sources as to ABSS, the school, not the board itself, but the individuals that are the administration. Uh, and I understand for some of the other school board members <coughs> that that has not stopped. There, there may be future changes as well. They're not telling me who, what, when, or where, but I'm just encouraged to know that hopefully things will happen. We can provide the funding we can't make them do it. You can. And Mr. Johnson, I'm not only looking at you individually, but I'm talking about the entire audience out there in TV land, radio land, the tax-paying citizens. Because if you encourage and talk to the school board, they're the ones that can make it happen. We cannot make them spend the money. Um, Things are changing, thank goodness. Greg Hook, who's uh, head of operations currently, 
is really moving things much quicker than his predecessor. And I am really thanking Mr. Hook, the new operations manager, for the uh, positive job that he's, he's doing, but it's still not as quick as this board would like things to move. Contact your school board members. That's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else? Motion to adjourn. Do we have Second. a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Have a motion to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We're, we're no longer in session. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.tv TVNC.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.